morning, good afternoon, good evening, however you're watching, wherever you're watching, and however you're listening, wherever you're listening. It's the Battle Launch to the Detroit podcast, and the tripod is back bigger and better than ever. The beard is back on Madman. Ryan trimmed up a little bit, and I just look like a Neanderthal. I need to trim mine up, but it is what it is. Excuse my green screen. I got ceiling fans, AC, all kind of fans. It's it's a, it's officially 90 degrees in the Inland Empire today, so it is a hot <laughs> one out here. The summer is coming, and June gloom is gone. Ryan, how are you doing today? What is up? Good. Yeah, we fought summer for a while, right? Like I feel like we had pretty cool temperatures all through May and June and even here in Pasadena, I think it hit like 88 today or 89. So almost 90. So yeah, summer's here, which means we got uh, two more months of no football, but uh, yeah, I'm doing well. How you doing? I'm doing well. And the man himself, Mr. 18 PhDs, Jamal, Matt, man, Magby, how are you doing today, Jamal? Doing well, coach. Great to see you as always. Great to see Rye, bearded bandits back in the house. We got two more months, as Ryan said, for football. But, Coach, I got to be honest with you. I'm still, like, staggered in the middle of the ring with, with my Lakers this week with uh, with the Dan Hurley news turning down 70 mil to go back for the three-peat with UConn. 20-year anniversary to the day of the Lakers trying to get Coach K back in 04 after Phil. So, we'll see, man. Uh, you know, lots to talk about with the Trojans, but man, my Lakers, uh, you know, I'm staggering right now. I'm staggering back to the corner of the ring. <laughs> hey, so, so speaking of other sports, you remember a long time, well, a while back when the baseball first started and I said, Teoscar Hernandez is going to be the Dodger that everybody's yep. going to love. Teoscar is on a streak right now. He is. Teoscar is killing it. So, Everything is I, I actually Colin Cowherd actually made a good point, believe it or not. Colin, yep. we, we have our own Colin Cowherd, which is hot take tad, but <laughs> Colin Cowherd made a good point. He said, Are the Lakers willing to rebuild while all the other sports in LA are hot? Mm. I was like, that's probably the best thing he's ever said. Like, are they willing to rebuild while all the other sports are hot? And so that's a question you have to ask. Do you do you think it, before I move on more because I've seen this going around now, like, do you think the Lakers are like kind of a strapped cast organization now? Like not with all these rich billionaires buying teams. I mean, the Lakers, it's family money, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I think that the difference though, their rise, it's salary capped, right? So it's at the end of the day, you can't like outspend anyone else too much more luxury taxes, like 30, 40 million, which, you know, for all these owners is kind of chump change. I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I just think the Lakers need new ownership, you know, to that point. I think, I think Whoa. I love Jeannie and, you know, love that she was Dr. Buss's daughter and all of that. But Jeannie definitely runs the Lakers like a mom and pop shop. And, you know, she trusts like four people on earth. And all four of those people at one point or another have either been the Lakers president and GM or their most trusted advisor. And I think she's just got to either really retool as a leader and really open up the aperture and bring in more more thought leadership or she's got to look to sell the team at some point but you know the lakers will always be la i -hmm. think they'll never have a hard time getting stars here but you need that you need that management for sure so here's a fun question sorry to cut you off again al but obviously there's a few but can you guys name and i don't know the answer but can we can you can we name five organizations that have been family owned that the kids actually did just as good a job as the the parents i mean you could probably no. name one or two it's just like historically they never do well when it passes down to the kids ever i can only name one yankees yankees i can only name one the steelers yeah steelers. that's yeah. probably the best one. well name and yankees are, yeah. yeah trying to think of others but Bronx, yeah, I mean, the Charger, yeah, not many. <laughs> it's true, though, right, right? I mean, it's it's yeah. never going to be the same when it's a visionary parent, when it's that the, the, the person that built the empire has to go through so much. There's such a there's such an <laughs> education there. There's such a hustle there. There's such a drive, a desperation, a vision. The kids will never have that right when you when you've grown up with a silver spoon and everything that comes with it. It's just very difficult to be able to recreate that. So yeah, I'm totally with you and we'll see. I mean, 
it's it's also interesting that a lot of these billionaires now, you know, you're you're seeing a new wave of ownership too, particularly in the NBA. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see like the Clippers, for instance. I mean, they've you know, Balmer's put a ton of money. The Intuit Dome, I think, is going to be a great place to go. But at the end of the day, if you don't get the stars to show up and, you know, you don't get the marquee free agents in your roster, it's going to be really hard. Like, as great as Balmer is as an owner, I would say that the the team with the bleakest future in the NBA the next three years is the Los Angeles Clippers <laughs> because their best players are not available. They, they You can't trust them yeah. uh, in, in crunch time. So they're, they're caught in sort of no man's land. So the owner can only take you so far. But you kind of need it, you know, to sort of for those building blocks. And I, I worry about the future of the Lakers for sure. I, which is weird to me. And before we go to the, the football stuff, which is weird to me because Jeannie was there the whole time when Dr. Buzz built this thing. Like she yeah, was but she was never her- there on the basketball side. It was all the business side. It was all about, um, hey, how do we go get the partnerships and the sponsorships? And how do we go operationalize? like the Laker girl brand and how do we close that deal with UCLA health and how do you know, there was all of this other stuff. It was the business side. You know, I think the biggest mistake still to this day that the Lakers made organizationally hard for a team that's won 17 championships, but I think letting Jerry West go. And I think that that was the biggest mistake that the Lakers have made in their franchise history. And I think that opportunity to even they should have never let him go to Memphis. Number one, he he did a great job. But when even if they let him go to Memphis after Phil, because there was that struggle, you know, that power struggle with Phil Jackson, and he felt it, and he 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 left. And it's it's fitting. I'm saying this without even realizing that the great Jerry West passed away today. The logo, the legend, one of the truly great, not just players in the history of the NBA, but I would say the Mount Rushmore of figures in the NBA. Not just the fact that he was the logo, all time great player unbelievable coach, unbelievable GM, unbelievable advisor. I think Jerry West, Pat Riley, Phil Jackson, Red Auerbach are probably the Mount Rushmore of figures in the history of basketball. Going to be unbelievably missed, uh, both in Los Angeles, but just in the game. But they should have brought Jerry West back the moment he left Memphis, and he should have been running this team since 2011, 2012. I promise you there'd probably be at 20 banners by now if Jerry West was running the team. Yeah. Was that was that 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 was Jim Bus? Jim Bus. Jim Bus calls, Jim Bus calls all yeah. that. Yeah. The same yeah. Jim Bus that <laughs> overpaid for Luel Dang and Timofey Ugh. Mozgov, and you know that Jim Bus. You know, yeah. who probably is it would be hard for him to get a table at Polo Lounge these days because <laughs> given what he's done to the Lakers. So, yeah. definitely. Uh, yeah. All right, off of the L.A. sports and on the b- football. I was about to say, and on the basketball, <laughs> SC basketball. <laughs> SC's basketball, they have no roster. And yeah, they do now. So. They got all their commits they now. Do. The must <laughs> bus, baby. I was joking with somebody the other day. In three years, they're either going to the Sweet 16 or back on probation. That's how we roll with the must bus. <laughs> it's one of two outcomes. There's no there option C. <laughs> there we go. So speaking of recruits, actually, we had another big recruiting weekend. Uh, our, I guess we could say our top commit, Julian Lewis, came in. Uh, Dorian Brew, Riley Pettijan, Andrew Marsh, Malachi Autry, Noah Malkali, Dylan McHale. McCutcheon, huh? McHale, I think. I don't something like that. Yeah, McHale. Yeah, Dylan McCutcheon, Hayden Lowe. Out of all Nin- that, nineteen total. Nineteen total. That's not nineteen on here, but. Yeah. I told you that pre-show. I'm like, there's a list. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, you threw me off guard. You threw me off guard when you said the 19. But, uh, yeah, 19 total. These are just some of the top ones that came in. And we got a commit out of it. We got Hayden Lowe out of Charter Oak High School. Defense in six, either 6'2", six, we'll say 6'2 and a half to 6'3", between 230 and 245. We'll put it like that because we got all kinds of sizes and weights, which is good. There's two positives in this, right? The two positives is he's a four-star athlete, which is better for recruiting because we're starting to re- recruit upper-tier stars. He's a big defensive end. There's three. Excuse me. There's three. He's a big defensive end that's going to gain weight. Say he comes in at 240. By the time he goes through his first summer lift program, he'll gain, he could get to the 260 weight by the time he starts to gain his grown man weight. Here's the third thing. He's a Southern California kid. 
His hometown is considered L.A., so he's probably doing that illegal stuff that Catholic schools are allowed to do in the CIF, get picked <laughs> up and get all those extra benefits. So uh, he's a Southern California kid, So, which means that SC staff is dipping into Southern California again, starting to pique that interest. And the only way you do pique interest is by winning. Is this a good addition? 100%. This is great depth. This is the 2025 class, right? So they'll be it. They graduate this upcoming. They'll graduate next summer and they'll be there two weeks later, like it normally goes yeah. and start and uh, start their career. So that's really good. A lot of DBs, a lot of receivers in. There are some linebackers that are good size, 6'2", 6'3", 210, 220 pounds. So we're starting to see bigger kids being recruited than we have in the latter years. And we're starting to see good size and good athletic systems coming in and are interested in USC. My one worry about these visits are there's no longer only five minutes. It's five visits. It's unlimited visits. You start to ask the question, how many kids are just taking a trip to L.A. in the summer? Because 19 is a lot at one. You can't give a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. I, I am not a fan of it, but this is their program. This is how they're doing. I'm on watch and see mode. But we did get a recruit out of it. And I will say this, and Jamal, this is a question for another day. Write this down so we can remember it. What if, no, hear me out. This is a really good question. What if NIL starts to get, starts to become a different, you start to phase NIL, right? So you could be a part of the recruiting aspect of it, or you could be a part of the play, the pay for play aspect. I think the ROI is better on the recruiting because if you put a lot of money in and you start to see recruits come in, you can see it work. The pay for play ROI is a little bit different. So that's something I think is worth talking about another day. I thought about that today while I was driving in traffic. Hayden Lowe's coming in, big recruiting visit. Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, good get. Uh, I mean, I know, Coach, you got to love the size that they're recruiting and and the size of this kid, as you mentioned, 6'3 ish to 30 ish in that range. Obviously, will be bigger when he comes in. I think the interesting thing with him is he, th this very weekend, June 7th, had a, a scheduled visit for Oregon. He canceled that visit to come to SC and committed on the spot at SC. So I think that shows that not only did he buy into what, you know, Coach Henny, Coach Nua, Coach Riley were all, were all selling, but he wants to stay home, wants to be in LA, wants to be a USC Trojan. So, I mean, those are all good things without actually talking to him. That's just assumption, but um, yeah, I mean, so it's a great get another great weekend. It's I'm sure you guys have seen this. It's, Report, it's not the right word, but indications are there's there were two more commits over yeah. the weekend based yeah. on um, some Nico breadcrumbs from Twitter. Well, not just Nico, like Lincoln Riley and the USC yeah. Trojan USC football account, um, plus other coaches. So, you know, I, I've been digging there. There's suppose, yeah, there's for sure. I think two more that will come out. Um, they haven't fully announced yet. One, if I were guessing, I, I want to say is is the um receiver he's going to officially announce the end of this month usc is in his final three um but he had a really good visit spoke highly so part of me this is just me guessing i'm just thinking that he's committed but he's going to wait to do his announcement in front of his family and stuff and then announce it so um but i and then the other one i think is uh a kid out of uh he's canadian but out of miami i, I should have these names in front of me um but he's another one that I think will be the, the second one, and there could be more. So overall, just a, a fantastic weekend, I think. If you can get three commits out of it, um, you know, obviously that's a that's a huge win for USC. Put a pin in that, Ryan. Let's save that. The two commits I want to commit later because I have a comment on that. When I saw that this weekend, I instantly had a comment on that, and I, I'll tell you why I don't like it, and it has a lot to do with why the Lakers did were unable to get the coach that came this weekend. Jamal, what do you think about the recruit the weekend and uh, the big commitment? Yeah, no, I'm. I really like uh, Hayden Lowe. I, I think again, you you guys said it really well. I think there's sort of three things that that stick out in a tremendous way. One is edge help. I mean, what what have we been kind of hold the edge, for? hold the edge, defensive line, edge help. So that's number one. Number two, you guys mentioned it. The SoCal. I mean, Oaks Christian. Is a, is a power from, you know, he's from Westlake Village. Again, kind of trying to reestablish some of that pipeline. I remember the most famous Oaks Christian player uh, when I was at SC was actually Jimmy Clausen. And, and I remember when Jimmy Clausen committed to Notre Dame and came in the limo to Notre Dame and, and in his opening press conference said he's going to win four Heismans. And we were like, give me a break with this guy, you know. But that's neither here nor there. But I always associate 
Oaks Christian with Jimmy Clausen, but great that he's a hometown kid. And then number three, I think the big X factor is what is Eric Henderson going to do with this talented young man again at, you know, generously we're saying somewhere between six, two and a half and six, four, somewhere between two thirty and two forty five. So there's some, some weight that needs to be had here, particularly in the trenches of the big 10. So what the weight room is going to look like, the diet, the regimen, the conditioning. So this is sort of the Michelangelo that is Eric Henderson. He's got his beautiful, you know, block of marble here. Now can he turn it into the statue of David here is, is really the question uh, from that front. And then I think the, the visits were tremendous. I mean, another big day uh, for SC, 19 visits like you talked about. Coach, you may be alluding to this, you may not be. I think we're also sort of entering a world where recruiting practices, recruiting behaviors, recruiting rituals are going to start changing. And I kind of equate it to speed dating. I I look at some of these visits as kind of speed dating. And and speed dating, ironically enough, is coming back, you know, because the Gen Zers don't want to go on dating apps. Again, I digress. But (laughs) in in the, the, the sort of the speed dating world, I think you're bringing in 19 and you're trying to sort of see, hey, we have some preconceived notions of some guys that we really want. Um, Who's showing interest? Who's sort of a leader amongst their peers? Who's asking the right questions? Who feels like a cultural fit? Who who sort of is the, the raw athlete that we believe that they are in person? And sometimes you use these visits of saying, hey, we walk away from the 19, but out of that 19, we really like five or six. And maybe two or three of them commit, and then we get to focus on the other two or three that have not committed, and then also in parallel say, hey, the two or three that have, let's make sure that we retain them. So I think in this new world of recruiting, Coach, to your point where it's unlimited visits, you got to filter out the guys that are just here for the L.A. trip like you talked about and try and get to that place of interested party as quickly as possible. And I think usually the goal with – bringing in 19 players and say, who's that five or six? Who's that top third that we can sort of move forward with much in the way you kind of approach speed dating. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. So, so the mistake that the Lakers made this past weekend is they let Dan Hurley go home and they did not tell let they did not make him tell them no to their face. Right. If I'm the Lakers, I'm telling them I'm keeping Dan Hurley here till Tuesday. He would have got on a plane on yesterday and he would have had to tell me no to my face the deandre jordan the deandre jordan to the dallas mavericks move you remember that from you know eight ten years ago where they cuban wouldn't let him leave yep he kept him there and had to tell him no to his face yeah i remember that so the and the reason why i say that like malik archery he's committed to auburn why are you still going on trips if you're committed to auburn do commitments not mean anything anymore or or i would say this when we were coming up, we were always told if you have multiple offers and you don't know where you're going to go yet, at least commit to one so you have something locked up because it schools don't have to honor commitments, but it looks bad on the school if they go away from the commitment, right? So, like, I was committed to you. How are you going to take away my scholarship? So are they locking up offers just to have offers and then still shopping around? Maybe. I don't know. But. Neither, neither here nor there. What the point I'm alluding to is they're saying there's two more offers that are coming out and they're just going to announce it at the, end of the, at the end of the month. They're going to announce it here, they'll announce it there. Me, personally, I do not like that. Personal experience, I've been burned that way. Coach, I'm committed to you. Don't worry. I just want to take this one more visit. No, nah, you don't need to go on a visit. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next thing you know, hey, coach, I'm not going to come in here. I'm going to end up going there. That is my biggest worry. Right. And that's PTSD being in that situation, knowing that when you when you're still looking for a prom date, even though you told a girl you're going to take her to the prom and the prettier girl comes along, that previous prom date no longer matters. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's what worries me about that. And that kind of like, hey, like, why are we waiting? Why can't we get the commitment out now? Some may say it's too much pressure on them and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's business and we need to get this business closed like you're learning to become a man. Here's the first step of becoming a man. This is the first official sign contract you're going to sign is a national letter of intent. Let's commit. Let's say you're coming here. There's nothing else to do about this. So that's how I feel about the two commitments coming at the end of the month. If they come, they come. But I'm not comfortable with it, and I would never be comfortable with it. 
Ryan, you got anything on that or you're good with it? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, and just real quick, just so I make sure I get the names right. So the two I was talking about are receiver Corey Sims, Adam is, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Corey Sims, and then uh, Floyd Bucard is the um, defensive tackle. So those are the two names. But, but no, I mean, I, I get it, I agree. But I mean, unfortunately, that's just the way college football is now. I mean, I, I don't remember. I could be wrong. I'm trying to think back, but I'm not, I just don't remember commitments even happening this early, like before signing day. I mean, you have kids from 26 and 27 committing all of a yeah. sudden um, that far down the line. So it's just kind of the way it is now is kids commit, but they still keep their recruitment open and go on visits. And, you know, as a university, if you're going to, you can try to play hard nose or you, it, you know, and maybe it works or maybe you just continue to get burned because kids are like, Oh, I don't have the freedom to, to search around and see what's best for me. And they only, care about me playing here and not what's best for me. So I, I, I totally get it. I agree, but that's kind of just the way college football is now. So, <laughs> but hopefully the two that the two that everyone's saying are going to commit, we, we actually get officially two more. Man, man, what are your thoughts? No, I, I agree with you, coach. It's, it's a new world out there. There's no question. And I think as Ryan said it best, it's, it's the world we have to adapt to. I also think, again, it's sort of the song and dance that you have to play. I, I don't think you can realistically walk away from a, a visit like the, this past weekend and say, we got our top one, two, three guys. You just got to think about it. Even in terms of class of 2025, these kids haven't yet quite finished junior year or just about finished junior year. They got their summer between junior and senior year and then a whole nother academic and football season. I mean, the amount of life that happens, particularly at that age, in mm-hmm. terms of exposure over the summer or they, you know, get a new girlfriend or, you know, something with their family pulls them in a different direction or they sort of blow up their senior year and then they get attention from schools that maybe they secretly wanted, but they didn't. There's just so much variability from now until them actually putting on a Trojan uniform that, again, you you have to sort of do the song and dance. You have to show your presence. You have to keep selling yourself. But I think it it sort of becomes the wall street line, right. Where it's like, always be closing, you know, and you're yeah. just sort of in that mindset where you just don't take any recruit for granted. And even if they come and say, I've committed now, you're not, you're not like chiseling that in stone. You're like, well, we got to keep it, uh, you know, retained and, and keep it that way. So you're just always, I think in salesman mode, uh, moving forward. And I think that's just the new reality that we're in. ABC Jamal hitting with the ABC. Always, Always be closing. closing. Those of you listening on the Mightier 1090, thank you for listening. See you guys. This is Bet Online Salute Joy Podcast. So, um, there's another storyline that came out this weekend, and we're going to go ahead and try to Jew, Lou, is. Yep. So, Julian Lewis was there. Julian Lewis is committed. Julian Lewis has been saying he's all about USC. So, th- something's hit the Twitter world. Or is it X? Are we supposed to say X or Twitter? I refuse to call it X. It's okay, officially so X now, but you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> saying that Lincoln Riley has decided to pass up on the top-rated quarterback in class of 2025 and stand focused on Julian Lewis. I would like to call this Lincoln Riley's first mistake of the offseason. He's been doing so well. And he finally left a pin up in the alley and destroyed this perfect game. Um, I don't like it, and I'll tell you why I don't like it. And we 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 already touched upon it, right? Like Jamal just said, so many things could happen, and the school might with he secretly Julian Lewis secretly might really want to go to might actually tell him what they need to hear, right? Or they might give him the paycheck he wants to get, and or or I mean to be honest with you. God forbid, knock on wood. Miller Moss gets hurt. Mayava plays. Mayava blows up, right? He blows up, and he's the guy for the next three years. You know what I mean? Like, now what do you do for your Julian Lewis? For you to be all in on one quarterback at this stage and the way things go in the recruiting land, to me, is a very, very risky situation. But it also tells me this. Lincoln Riley has not learned from his mistake last year with Caleb Williams. He's not creating any type of competition, right? And he's saying, oh, well, there's no starting quarterback and there's a competition between Moss and Mayava. I call BS. We know who the starter is. There's nothing. There's no 
There's nothing hitting there, right? We'll be more surprised if Mayava starts than if Miller Moss starts. True or false? You know what I mean? If Miller Moss has started, oh, we knew. If Mayava starts like, oh, what happened? That's, you know, we're, we're, hey, we need to do a live show. We're trying to figure out where we are and how we can get this live show and figure out what happened. But for you to be all in on Julian Lewis right now, and him, he could balk that commitment at any moment, at any day, at any time. He's not inked in. Also, you need to create some type of quarterback depth, and there's no quarterback depth at USC of valuable players. To me, it kind of shows that there is no environment of competition within the football program, and that scares me, and that means that they are not moving forward philosophically in this program. I could be wrong. This is just my opinion. But for you, to, for you to pass up a quarterback that wants to come to your school, I don't know if he wants to come, come here or if he just said no. I don't know how it all played out, but this is how it came out, that he's good on this guy and he's all in on Julian Lewis. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And it scares me because of the lack of competition that is being created. That's where I stand on it. Jamal, what do you think? Well, I mean, Fred, I got to – you know, I think I got to go back to sort of the dating point here of, you know, Julian and USC. I mean, I think a couple of days ago, he's, you know, Julian's like, look, I'm fully committed to USC. I'm just going on these other visits because I just want to explore. I want to sort of explore life, explore culture um, elsewhere. And just, you know, kind of, I have the opportunity to go see other schools. So why not? Right. And so I think for SC, I don't know if this is as big like a deal as it's being made out to be. I mean, one, I think to, to Ryan's point about like when this was actually said and done versus kind of today. But I think the deeper point is, look, you've got Miller Moss in 2025 with one more year of eligibility, right? He's got a year of eligibility this year. He's got a year of eligibility in 25. You've got Maeva who has three more years of eligibility today, but two more from 25 onwards. So you got another two quarterbacks that have started in college football, that have experience, that both either have one year left or have two years left. So you really have three quarterbacks, you know? And so at the end of the day, how much do you need to go recruit another guy knowing full well the transfer portal is essentially always open and... If Lewis is kind of your guy, then, you know, the chances are the, the other person is going to transfer. So why is it worth the effort of going and pursuing another person? Right. So this is also kind of, you know, a little bit of a false narrative where, you know, Maeva's not sliced bread. Miller Moss isn't sliced bread. So there's definitely going to be enough to push Lewis, who's going to be, oh, by the way, a true freshman uh, in 25. So. I don't know if there's no competition here, uh, but I think, you know, to sort of your point, there is sort of all of the eggs in the the Julian Lewis basket. I mean, look, let's be honest here. I think this is Lincoln Riley is attaching himself to Julian Lewis and the success or failure, I think, of Lincoln Riley's tenure as a USC football coach is going to be inextricably linked to Julian Lewis you know, more so than even Caleb Williams, more so than any other player. I think we won't get into it here. Whatever the expectations of year three are, however year three shakes out, I think given where we're seeing all of the recruiting going in 25, all the edge help, all of these athletes, you know, Gibson, Justice Terry, all of these other guys, this is all 25 and beyond. So this is sort of setting up for, hey, 25, 26, is really kind of that moment for Lincoln Riley. And who's probably going to be his quarterback in 25-26 is going to be Julian Lewis. So we're ultimately going to remember Lincoln Riley by how good Julian Lewis is, more so than any other player. So they're tied together, I think, in terms of a Lincoln Riley legacy at USC in a way that Lincoln Riley had a very deep relationship with Caleb Williams, right? So I agree with you there. But in terms of the other piece, I think it's a little bit of, you know, chicken and the egg, a little bit of possum, because I think there is a tremendous amount of competition with Julian Lewis in 25 and beyond. Ryan. Yeah. I, I, you know, I agree with both of you. I think, uh, 
to your point, Al, there's definitely a risk, you know, tying all in to, to one recruit and not, you know, throwing, uh, throwing stuff at, at other recruits as well. But to Jamal's point, I agree. I mean, the eligibility is there for the, the quarterbacks they have in house. I think also when you look at, you know, the timeline of this, you know, Julian Lewis committed so early, August 22nd, and we don't know what that, and obviously things, I mean, there's still six months till signing day. Right. So, I mean, things can still happen. I'm not, it's not no thing. Nothing is a guarantee. Even when that signing's done, you know, flips can happen. So, um, but I think, you know, we weren't in those rooms with him and his dad, TC Lewis, and, and there could have just been this conversation that, you know, Hey, we're all in, if you're all in, let's make this happen. We're obviously going to, you know, still visit my kids, a sophomore right now in high school. Like we want to enjoy the experience, but we know you based on your track record, is the best option to get my son to the NFL level. As long as NIL and this other stuff takes care of itself, like we're committed to you and whatnot. So I think if this would have been going into January, February, March, and he hadn't committed, then probably there would have been other offers to other quarterbacks. But because it was so early, if Bryce Underwood, who's the quarterback we're referring to as the consensus number one overall recruit, recruit, um, our girl uh, Cameron, uh, Candace Davis Price's guy out of, out of Belleville High School in Michigan, um, you know, if this conversation with which Steve Wilfong didn't say exactly when it happened, but if it was September after, um, Julian Lewis committed, then it makes sense. It's like, Hey, we're all in. It, it makes more sense for you to visit elsewhere. Um, we're going on this guy. So it's a risk. I think the track record speaks for itself. I have no problem with it. I kind of like the, the, you know, fully committed and, uh, just going all in on a guy and, and trusting that, you know, you've built yourself enough track right at the quarterback position that, you know, speaks for itself. So, you know, obviously we got to get to, to December and, and signing day, but I think with the room they have, and then with everything we've seen thus far out of the, the camp of Julian Lewis, I think it's in a good spot. So um, I agree. It's not like it, it's turned into a, a, a fun story just when as soon as you hear, you know, turns away number one consensus. Um, but Hey, in 2021, Caleb Williams was the number two consensus. Quinn Meyer, Quinn Ewers was the number one consensus. So, you know, I trust uh, Lincoln Riley's eye in quarterbacks. So are you guys saying? You know, you know what's interesting here? here is how long does the track rec- record last? Like the the biggest issue here is does he stay committed if SC has kind of a shaky year? Like if you have another eight and five in the world that we're in and the immediacy of this world. If Lincoln Riley goes back to back eight and five, and I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but just in a hypothetical world, do we still think of him as having this track record? It's kind of a ridiculous statement, actually, because he still has coached the Heismans. You know, Caleb will have just been, you know, three years removed from his Heisman trophy year, but we all know how this works. We all understand the immediacy of this sport. Nobody has a memory anymore. If you haven't done anything in the last 12 to 18 months, it's like you've never done it. So, <laughs> How long does that track le- record last? I mean, if, if Lincoln Riley is 16 and 10 in his last two years as USC quarterback, do you still believe he is the ideal person to develop you, develop your son, and take you to the next level? So in a lot of ways, I think... Sorry? Let me ask you this, because it's a great point. If, and again, we're not saying that, but let's say they go eight and five, whatever, not a great season, but Miller Moss finishes top five in Heisman voting just has a great year as a quarterback. Does that still do enough? Or is it like, nah, I I want wins matter. Or are you like, man, Miller Moss never played a game and all of a sudden he's top five in Heisman in one year under Lincoln Riley. You know, I mean, it's, I think, I think it'll, I think it'll really help the the (laughs) case. It's a great point. But then the counter to that, Ryan is, is it a top five, like great college year or is it a top five great prospect year? where if he's top five and he's coming back then in 25, does that change yeah, your no. calculus, right? Yeah. Because then you're like, well, I'm friggin' Juju Lewis. I'm, I'm coming to start or compete to start as a true freshman. Look, no matter how great you are, you're probably not going to beat out a top five Heisman guy, you know, just on the incumbency effect alone. So does, does Lincoln Riley sort of overperforming with Miller Moss actually cost him Juju Lewis, you know, in 25. So Not a worst it case can scenario. go so many different ways, right? Which is, which is what's so interesting. We're like, he's committed now, but there's just so much life and so much ball to happen from now until 25 that you just never know. You know, there's a world where Lincoln Riley underperforms 
and can't get Juju Lewis because he loses the track record. There's a world where Lincoln Riley overperforms and can't get Juju Lewis because he's overperformed. So it's it's kind of fascinating how it can all shake out. I think the thing that scares it is, is I don't think Miller Moss is, is a scary factor of this. I think my is more of the scary factor of this because of how much years of eligibility he has, right? So we understand that Juju Lewis will have to come in and sit a year, right? But let's say we understand just, that. But does Juju Lewis understand that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Does Juju Lewis <laughs> yeah. understand that? That's a, that, that's a good question. So so let's just say, let's just say, like, here's where it could get scary, though, because you could get to a point, let's say next year they go 10 and 2 quarterfinals, they get bounced, right? Miller Moss has a great quarterback year, projected number one, a first, not a number one overall, but first round draft pick. He could play in the NFL. He goes. Mayava plays, right? Now he's eligible for the draft, right? Because it's second, yeah, he's eligible for the draft and 25. Juju Lewis sits behind him. They go undefeated and they lose in the national championship. And I understand this is hypothetical. As Lincoln Riley, do you talk to Mayava and tell him, hey, let's come back for another year and let's try to run it back and get what we missed out on? Or do you let him go and say, we have Juju Lewis. He's the guy that could get us over the hill. And that falls under what you could fall when what you said, Jamal. I can either help you or hurt you. What do you do as Lincoln Riley in that po- case in point then now? Now you're in a situation where Juju Lewis is like, all right, I'm gone. I could go, I'm gonna go into the portal. I'm not gonna play here for another year. I'm gonna go somewhere else. Now you're short a quarterback. So maybe I'm saying maybe you don't need the number one quarterback, but maybe you need the number 25 quarterback. Maybe you need the number 30 quarterback. Maybe you get lucky and get the number 15 quarterback. But you need another quarterback because the depth truly isn't there. Like the year where SC went through all three of the quarterbacks. They were all good. Three, all three of those quarterbacks were good. All three of those quarterbacks have very high. Well, one of them had a low ceiling. But you know what I mean? One of them is in the NFL starting on the Vikings right now. Right. So it's like it, it those things can't happen. And like I just maybe it's the thing like I play worst case scenario first. And how do we get through the worst case scenario? Because if you do everything, the good takes care of itself. The bad never takes care of itself. So how do we get through the bad? And that's my worry that I have with the bad, because even though he does come, he still has the ability any time to leave. So what do you do if he leaves, and how do you protect yourself if you leave? We're going to go flood the portal? When are we going to get out of that game, right? And it looks like they're trying to get out of that game, but they're not putting themselves in a, a situation where they have to rely on the portal to get out of that game. You guys get what I'm saying from there? Ryan, yeah. Jamal? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's the good and the bad of the portals. It works with you and it works against you. So, right. I mean, if you were to hit it, they would be able to go and get someone in it. But I think gone are the days, and I know you're just saying offer, not necessarily bringing a recruit, but gone are the days of just three years ago when USC brought in Jackson Dart and Miller Moss in the same recruiting class, like two five-star right. quarterbacks. Like right. those days are gone. That's not happening anymore, ever again. You're those not days are gone, players. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You heard it from Rye so, or Die. They're gone. <laughs> okay. You have to, in my opinion, pick your who you want and go all in on it. So that, that's yeah. me. So no, it's a great point, Ryan. Uh, you know, and, and coach, I agree with you in, in, in terms of what you were saying. Nothing to add there. I'll tell you, we're, we're talking about this from a very Lincoln Riley centric lens of like, what does Lincoln Riley have to do to sort of maintain just, you know, fun hypotheticals? Rightfully so. He's earned that with the type of quarterbacks that he's gotten. But I'll pose you guys this. There's three guys I'm actually worried about where if it, as from a coaching perspective, if they blow up. In, in this year in 24, that it could be a concern. Number one, Brian Kelly. Can you imagine if Kelly goes back to back with Heisman winners at quarterback? You know, like if the LSU quarterback follows Jaden Daniels and wins the Heisman, now all of a sudden, Brian Kelly is the quarterback whisperer that everybody's sort of talking about. Almost usurps Lincoln Riley in a way. I would be worried about Juju considering he's already from the South. And then the other two guys, I got to be honest with you, like if Ole Miss and Jackson Dart kind of blow up or Ewers and Texas blow up, Kiffin and Sark scare me here because if they sort of blow up with these programs, given the NIL funding that those two schools have, 
and you factor in that both of those guys are XSC guys. They understand West Coast football too, and now are doing it kind of in the South, uh, you know, the, the, the SEC South and, and the Texas South. Um, that sort of makes me nervous. And so we're looking at this purely from kind of a Lincoln Riley perspective. And look, we're still like 95% chance, I think, that Juju Lewis is a USC Trojan in 25. But if for that 5%, if he's not, I kind of have my eye on like LSU. I've got my eye on Ole Miss and I've got my eye on Texas. Because if either one of those three schools kind of hits a grand slam this year and Ewers blows up and goes pro number one, and all of a sudden that pipeline gets built at those three schools with the types of coaches and the types of personalities they have, that's going to be a tough head-to-head competition. I think the I think the only difference is Jamal and, and Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams might be an anomaly, but the difference is that Ewers is going to be good wherever he goes. Same thing with Caleb. I think Caleb is good wherever he goes. Look, this is Sark's first good quarterback in his tenure. You know, I should say good. I'm sorry. First elite quarterback in his tenure. You sure. know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Of, of being a head coach, this is like his first elite yeah. quarterback. Yeah. So that one doesn't really scare me. The thing that scared the Brian Kelly thing is Brian Kelly's kind of a crybaby. And when he starts to not get his way, he kind of wants to bounce and go somewhere else. So yeah. like, that's kind of, well, that would be a recruiting attack. That would use like, if he gets mad at an administration, he's gone the next year. He could get a job anywhere. And I don't see him being competitive anytime soon if he was if he's true to his word about what he says about the portal. Like, I don't need to go to the portal. I'll just recruit high school guys and develop them. All right, cool. You go ahead and do that with your true freshman. And I got grown ass men who's played already in NCAA football. So that's the kind of I, – I just don't see him being competitive. So I now Kiffin, Kiffin is putting out quarterbacks, right? Kiffin always has a quarterback. That that one is kind of a threat. He's a quarterback guy, so that does make sense. That's a threat. But I, the jury's still out on Sark, and I'm not too sold on Brian Kelly and well, just his whole strategy behind the thing. So that's just and, my rebuttal to that. And the only thing I'll add to that is um, I, Ole Miss is a really interesting one. I don't, they haven't really been – I'm sure they offered Lewis. I haven't even looked, but they haven't really been on him. But the only other thing I'll add, I think you guys hit all the points, but the the only other difference is Texas, as of now, has a four-star 2025 commit. LSU has, obviously, Bryce Underwood, who's the same class as their commit. Ole Miss has no quarterbacks on their 2025 list. So they would definitely be the one that I would be a little nervous for. Kiffin, obviously, has NFL ties, and he's a fun coach. He, you know, is social media savvy. Ole Miss has a ton of money, as we know. They, they're, they're big in the transfer portal. So um, we're not saying anything that they, they haven't really been involved in any of this. But if there's one light, late bloomer, that's a great call, Jamal. Ole Miss is an interesting one. Yeah. And Texas has Lamborghinis on their visit that no player gets. So I don't know why that was then either. Did you guys see that? Yeah. I don't understand the point behind that. That wouldn't even be, I don't know. Maybe if I was eight, but I'm like, do we get this? No. Why are they here? That would have been my we, question. Even we didn't actually, eight. we were going to talk about it like last show, but I think we ran out of time, but just that falls under like the, the cheesiness of some of these recruits. Like some of these programs just do some cheesy things, man. Like th- there was one, uh, I saw a recruiting video, which USC did got a lot of praise again for the recruiting videos. But I think it was Missouri. Like their head mm. coach is like playing like guitar. Or, it's just, it's just like, it's uh. Missouri, man. You know, they got, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's Missouri. Uh, these places like, you know, I, I can't even really like criticize too hard because some of these places, as my dad would say, it's like, you know, you're bringing a sword to a gunfight. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like you know, when you, yeah. you're sort of competing yeah. with with the likes of a Los Angeles and a Hollywood. So it's uh, certainly winning. No question. I mean, I think SC's done a phenomenal job of leaning into the media savviness when it comes to these videos and, and recruiting visits. So. All fun stuff. Definitely. Coach, well, we're going to grab that snippet of yours after August 31st. And, and you know, when you talked about, well, LSU can't win and they don't have grown men. And, you know, so you're going to look like Nostradamus the morning of September 1st or, or the morning <laughs> of September 2nd, I should say. Or maybe, you know, there's a different conversation to be yeah. had, you know. <laughs> it, it's like, well, all coaching decisions, you can either be a genius or you can be an Absolutely. idiot. So I'm going to be one Absolutely. or the other. So we'll definitely see. So good deal. We're going to talk about LSU and USC later down the line. We're going to talk about projections later down the line. We got a bunch of good stuff coming 
but you still have to hold on. We're not quite there yet. It's like October 31st. He's like, all right, there's Thanksgiving and Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas as a kid. So we're almost yes. getting there. It's right around the corner. It's football is almost there. We're excited to do it. We're good to get into some USC football. But until then, hold tight. And we appreciate you guys holding tight with us. Ryan Jamal, we put another one in the books. It's been another great time. I enjoy you guys. Until we do it again, you guys know how to go. It's the Better Launch Detroit podcast. Live free. Fight on.